Thank you all for coming here on a day with such lousy weather. Um, we have a good panel here today, so um, we're going to have a, a very good discussion. I've been at the Wilson Center more than five years now, and this will be my last Japan event that I'll be organizing, so um, glad to see you here. Thank you. I'm, I'm going to be taking a hiatus from the workforce uh, on the birth of my first child. So, yeah. so I've enjoyed working with you all, and I, I'm sure I, I will again in the future. Uh, today we're going to talk about um, Japanese politics. And um, again, welcome. Welcome to um, NHK, which will be covering the event today. And we're going to discuss not only the election, uh, last month in Japan, but also we're going to take a long-term view and look at where Japan is likely to go in the future and to see the dominance of the LDP in post-war Japan um, in a larger context than just uh, one election. Fascinating, although it was, and all our panelists will give you their take on, on that. So our first speaker today 
is going to be I.G. Tanaka, and uh, he is a professor of political science at Waseda University, and um, he's also a visiting research fellow at the University of California at Irvine this year. And his latest research is on Japan as a one-party state um, and le the legitimacy of the Japanese political economic uh, system for post-war generations for the voting public in Japan. And uh, he spoke here a number of years ago um, on the rise of the independent voter. Um, his essay that he wrote uh, is still on our website, and I can help direct you to that. It's still very relevant to uh, the Japanese situation today. And we're very w happy to welcome him back here. You've picked up biographical information at the door, so, so I'll be brief and turn it over to our speakers. Thanks very much. Thank you very much, Amy. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, I'm Aji Tanaka. Uh, at Waseda University, and currently at UC Irvine, too. Uh, I'm very honored to be invited once more again uh, back here at Woodrow Wilson Center. Um, okay. Um, I would like to talk not only the you know, September 11th election, just about a month and a half ago, and, uh, but also like, what kind of change is taking place in Japan right now. And uh, uh, I'd like to look at, uh, actually I have like 26 pages of the uh, PowerPoint, and I don't think I can, I have time to go through over. <laughs> so uh, hopefully I will speak about first 10 minutes about uh, the changes 1960s up to 1993, and actually, actually 2003. And then I devote last five or seven minutes onto the last election, 2005. Okay, let me see. Uh, okay, for this period, I can divide uh, those periods into three, and pre-1993, LDP's non-party dominance. Uh, but that is a period of no variable opposition. Uh, by, I'm sorry, viable opposition. And uh, I will briefly talk about this later. And post-1993, after, after LDP split into two, you know, two camps, one traditional LDP and the other new central or still conservative parties. And this, uh, after 1993, and then seems to be the Japan party system still in this, this, this you know, stage. However, the uh, 2005 election was exception, so I will talk about this later. So I will divide um, in a period into three periods, and also I think we need a different explanation, unfortunately. Uh, I, would, I would love to you know, provide one clear explanation for entire period, why LDP stayed in power so long, but I have not solved that puzzle yet. And uh, I, right now I have to, you know, provide a different explanation for different period. And let's take a look at three periods of NLDP strength. Okay. This is from 1972, I'm sorry, 1979 through 2005. And the longest bar and the darkest bar is the uh, uh, number of eligible voters. The number of eligible voters in Japan grew from about 80 million to 100 million. And the year 2000, it reached about 100 million. And then, the second, you know, blue, blue bar, the second tallest one, that is the number of turned out voters, number of voters who turned out to the election, each election. And then it stayed about the same, about 60 million. And then the LDP, uh, the shortest bar, the pink bar, these are the uh, number of votes LDP gained at each election. And then they used to gain about 30 million, and then it went down from 1993 uh, it went down to like uh, slightly less than 23 million, 22, less than 22 million. And then year 2000, year 2000 and on, uh, LDP received help from the COMEI, CGP, Korean Government Party. Therefore, they gained 24 million, 25 million, 28 million, and so forth. However, I subtracted and help of the COMEI from LDP's actual vote and then that would be about 21, 21. So this is a pre-1993. And then green was uh, 1993 to 2003. And the estimate of the LDP votes about, stayed about 21 million. And clearly, 20, I mean, 2005 is different. Uh, actually, actually about 32 million. And even without Kome's help, they would have gotten about 20 million, I think. This is my estimate. And then, uh, the explanation for pre-1993 period is pretty easy. Um, 
this is this, um, based on my dissertation, legitimacy of the political economic system, political economic uh, system of Japan. And uh, I call it system support, and system support actually of the Japanese electorate for the uh, system of Japan. And then, um, actually, most of Japanese accept two principles of the liberal democracy and capitalism, or free market economy. And uh, anyone who accepts th these two principles had a hard time to look for another option than LDP to vote for. Mm -hmm. And b because the uh, second largest party in this period was the Japan Socialist Party. And Socialist Party was not really believing in the capitalistic economy, free market economy. And uh, free market, I mean, liberal democracy, they might, but uh, they liked the uh, Soviet Union so much. So many of the voters have some doubt if socialist took the you know, leadership of the Japan, then what would happen to the system? Not to the government, but to the system. And therefore, th although they do not trust LDP you know, from the bottom of their heart, still they had no other option to vote for. That was my explanation for pre-1993. And uh, I can see the, however, I can see the support for the democratic institution was pretty high. From 1976 to year 2004, uh, this is the highest one. Is that people's voice can be reached to national politics because of the uh, national election, because of the electoral system, and then people's voice can be held to national election, uh, national politics, uh, thanks to the. Uh, this is a party, and this is a diet. So uh, trust in the diet, trust to the party, and trust to the election, pretty high, like 82 percent, 70 percent, and so forth. And in 1976, this was the lucky scandal year. So political trust was pretty low. Political trust itself was 40, only 40%, but trust in democratic institutions were pretty high. And it went up to 1993. Why is that? Simply, probably simply because on 1993, the year, LDP lost the power of the government. LDP stepped out of the power this year. So Japanese temporarily observed the alternation of power. So they believed in that. You know, the Japanese political system is democracy. The alternation power takes place. This was, uh, this was 1993. But however, after that, especially after 2001, it dropped down very clearly. And unfortunately, I'm, I'm conducting the, some, some of the surveys these years. However, we changed the wording of the question. And that, that timing, unfortunately, coincided with the appearance of Mori Kiro, Kiro Mori of the Prime Minister, who was a uh, least popular prime minister of the world, you know, possible Japan's history. And when he stepped out of the prime ministership, uh, national trust of the politics was 11.1 percent, lowest. And uh, his cabinet approval rate was as low as Takeshita when he stepped out of the 1989 when the uh, recruit scandal took place. And, and at the same time, I don't, we cannot determine either way simply because of the change of the wording of the question or actually the time of the year, uh, time of the you know, period, the zeitgeist, uh, Japanese trust in the democratic institution went, went down very clearly. Then Koizumi came out, it went up. And uh, in year 2002, I introduced, I mean, reintroduced all the wording and the newer wording compared. Still, we even with newer wording, it went up. 15% or so. So actually, this is not simply because of the way we ask the question, probably because the way Japanese politics were conducted in these years. Japanese were so frustrated with the status quo, then they came to distrust of the democratic institutions as well. Because they have not seen the alternation of power from 1993, no matter what they do. That was a proper trouble. And therefore, and okay, this is, uh, I'm sorry. I, these three trusts and the national trust, and I overlaid uh, the cabinet approval rate. And the cabinet, cabinet approval rate fluctuated quite hard, quite big. And this is the Takeshita, when Takeshita stepped down, and this is when Mori stepped down. <coughs> and then when Koizumi came, up, came in, cabinet, cabinet approval rate went up so quickly. And it went down, but now it's pretty popular again, like the 50%. And uh, what does it mean can be explained in other in other data, yes. Okay, so 
post-1993, 1993 to 2004, and the rise of independent voters and the low voting turnout, and then possibility of the alternation power. Let me see what's the uh, rise of independent voters. This is the white one independent and the purple one the LDP. And the new part, new conservative parties, like a uh, new frontier party, the Shinsei, or Shinshin, or uh, you know, reform party, Shinsei, and so forth, so like Ozawa Ichiro's party, and then DPJ, Democratic Party, Minshito, came in this. And then JSP, JCP, the leftist, and central parties, uh, used to be Komei and the D, uh, Minsha, uh, Democratic Socialist Party. Now only Komei alone. And then don't know. And then L independent, share of the independent, according to public opinion polls, it uh, went up to 50%. This is according to monthly Yomiuri polls. And we can see the solid line is the LDP, the dotted line is uh, independence. Now the number of independents are more than the uh, number of partisans of the LDP, LDP partisans. Okay. And then I did the simulation. Um, when the independent voters are so many, and then the organized voters are so few. And according to my survey, national, nationwide survey in 1996, 43% of the respondents say they uh, belong to one of the organizations and politically in a mobilizable organization. And regardless of party, one of the uh, organization could be Labor Party, they could have been mobilized for Socialist Party or uh, Minshito, Democratic Party of Japan. And, uh, some of the people who are in belonging to the you know, agricultural cooperatives or uh, chamber of commerce or uh, senior citizens group and uh, youth group and so forth. And so 43% are about you know, are ready to go out to vote any time when they are mobilized organizationally. And, uh, but 55% of them are not, do not have organizational affiliation and they are not mobilized politically by any of the organizations. And then, so LDP and Komeito and Kome and also Japan Communist Party depend on the organi organized voters so much. And then the floating voters or independent voters could vote for anyone who could run Japan pretty well according to their, their promise or performance. And uh, I did a simulation according to the uh, expected voting turnout for year 2000. What I did was, uh, uh, denominator is eligible voters and turned out voters. Uh, eligible voter is a uh, hundred million, and so if the turn voting turnout rate was sixty percent, then about sixty million people went out to vote. And then uh, Communist Party has about ten million of the solid supporters. So they, no matter what happened, they have about ten million of the vote, and so their vote share goes down. Uh, I'm sorry, six million, about six million. So their vote share goes down when the voting turnout rate went up. More number of voters went out to voting booths. They, their share of vote goes down. So is the LDP and combined with Kome. And numerator here is uh, uh, LDP's number of votes in previous election plus Kome's number of votes, pretty solid, and uh, about 5 million. And, and plus LDP's about 22 million. And that was the uh, numerator. And then denominator is a uh, turned out vote. And then dotted, you know, big dotted line, I mean, broken line is the rest of all, which goes up because, you know, those parties who, which depend on the organized voters cannot increase the share of vote because they only depend on the organized voters and they know the number of votes. So if the more voters went out to vote, the rest of the all means DPJ, Democratic Party of Japan, the Socialist Party, and some of the liberal party or conservative smaller parties would combine, they would enjoy higher share of vote. And I predicted uh, voting turnout rate 63 would be the turning point. If the voting turnout would be lower than 63, LDP can and Kome can hold the power incumbency. And if it goes up, maybe 65 is a little too low because uh, the opposition party cannot win the rural single member district. So uh, I thought probably 67 percent would be needed to over, you know, overthrow the LDP by DPJ. And this year, voting turnout rate was 62.49, slightly below the 63. And the LDP and Kome maintain the power. 
And I did the same simulation for year 2003. And this time I predicted if voting turnout rate doesn't go up to beyond 61 point, LDP will hold the power. And then voting turnout rate was less than 60%. And then LDP hold the power. So this prediction was pretty accurate. What does it mean is LDP and co made heavily dependent organization and organized voters. They could not they could not attract any other voters than the organized voters. Therefore, this prediction was so so close. Now, however, what happened to <laughs> <laughs> However, <laughs> you know, the two thousand and five is a very different story. And uh, I could see why. Uh, okay. 2000, 2003, voting turnout was about 60%, or less, less than 60%. So 60 million voters went out to vote. And then there are about 35 million or close to 40 million people who did not vote for LDP, or no, who did not go out to vote. And only 22 or 21 million people voted for LDP. So you know, those people voted for some other parties. Many of them voted for DPJ. And then this if like uh, 38 million of 38 million who didn't uh, go out to vote decide to vote someone, you know, the political scenery would change dramatically. And uh, uh, I wrote in Chuo Koron in 2002, September 2002, that uh, like, uh, if, the, if LDP, either LDP or DPJ attracts uh, floating voters, independent voters of these, and if they're persuasive enough to, you know, if they are, you know, their appeals are persuasive enough to have them go out to vote, then they could win the majority vote easily by, by single party alone. And it doesn't matter, DPJ or LDP, whichever appeal to the independent voters. And which means if the LDP stick with the organized voters and if they want to keep providing the benefits to their clients, you know, if the um, LDP has been, uh, you know, relying on, on relying on the, you know, um, patron-client relationship, clientelism, and actually the uh, robot, um, Ethan Shiner, UC Davis uh, assistant professor, he wrote a great book. Just came out, just came out, and it says 2006, but it already came out. And it's a great book, and that explained very well and the opposition to failure, why LDP stayed in power so long. But he paid attention to the other side of my coin than I, the aspect I'm, I am paying attention. He, he is paying attention to the organized voters and how LDP has been providing the benefit to the clients. And I'm paying attention to the, those unorganized voters who have not received the benefit from the incumbent you know, LDP. And so those, those people who have not received the benefit from the incumbent LDP are organized, unorganized, and they are living urban, and they are higher education, they are more likely to be 54 years older or younger. 54 or younger. And some of them are 50 or younger. And, uh, but anyhow, the younger people and urban and uh, corporate employment, they do not have the agent which represents their benefit, their interest. You know, for the rural areas, they have their agent, their diet members, House of Representatives members. They represent their benefit from Shimane or Kumamoto and those prefectures. And the LDP mem diet members represent those, those interests of the rural interests or organized voters' interests. And those unorganized voters do not have agents to represent their interests. Then who did? The Koizumi did. And the Koizumi, okay, then. I'm running out of time, so going to <laughs> this year. Please take a look at this uh, graph one. Okay. <laughs> uh, this is a economic dimension. This is a IR or diplomacy, national security dimension. And right wing, what the conservative means, like uh, let's say fair economic policy and pretty hawkish realist, realist policy combined, that's conservative, and then the liberal, what liberal in Japan means, like a uh, very fair state orientation or socialist orientation, and or planned economy, plus liberal, liberalist or dovish, uh, inter IR, and the, so conservative versus liberal. And then uh, Nakasone, Abe Shinzo, and Koizumi, and, or these, and many of the LDP members are here, but some of the Kato or other people are here. And then Nonaka, who retired, and Kamei, uh, pretty liberal. 
And however, DPJ has the same kind of wide range of the positions with wide range of persistence from Maihara, Ozawa, Okada to Kan, and these. So pretty much in a parallel to LDP, but when, you, when we take a look at the different dimension, uh, yeah. economic dimension and the vertical dimension of the political reform orientation, depending on the traditional factionalism, client, clientelism, and that the you know, more status quo oriented political uh, stand. And then and political position which uh, opt for political reform and this is uh, down here. And then Nakasone, ex Prime Minister Nakasone, is kind of you know, long <laughs> around of that classical conservative person. And then the liberal is uh, she of the Communist Party leader and Doi ex uh, JSP socialist leader Doi and the classical liberal. And then Nakasone versus Doi. But nowadays, Japan political scenery is very different from uh, most of them reformists are here and then old time are here, uh, like uh, Abe Shinzo, Koizumi, and Kato Koichi, and then my head of the DPJ and Okada of DPJ. Uh, economic reform wise, very reform oriented, very laissez faire oriented, not so much uh, social welfare oriented. They don't want to provide the benefits to the older organized voters. And they were pretty reform oriented for political reform. They don't rely on uh, factionalism so much and clientelism so much. But Kamei and other old timers who are fiercely opposing to Koizumi's stand, they were pretty status quo oriented and they were very social welfare oriented, welfare state oriented. They want to provide the lots of benefit to the regardless of the you know uh, part of the region of Japan, regardless of the uh, political ideology, they want to provide you know benefits to the Japanese voters. Therefore they can be re elected. And Koizumi want to change it. And and then the misfortune of the DPJ is Okada and other people stand in the almost same location as Koizumi. And then um, Koizumi, I don't know intentionally or not, but Koizumi didn't attack Okada or DPJ so much. They penalized Kamei as an anti-reform orientation. However, the DPJ and Okada kept attacking Koizumi. Koizumi's reform was wrong, and our reform was correct. But what, what their message was, they were attacking Koizumi, and Kamei was attacking Koizumi, and Koizumi, Koizumi didn't attack DPJ, but penalized Kamei, which means, for the voters' perception, DPJ looked like anti-reform, as, as anti-reform as Kamei. Therefore, Koizumi won that, you know, 38 million of the floating voters, unorganized voters, and the DPJ couldn't get it. That was my story. Thank you very much. I finished? <laughs> Thank you. Okay, our next speaker is going to be uh, Leonard Chopa, who, if you'd like, you can uh, change seats. It might be easier. Okay. Yeah. Um, he is an uh, associate professor of politics at University of Virginia, and he also is a leading authority on Japanese politics. His forthcoming book is entitled Race for the Exits, The Unraveling of Japan's System of Social Protection. And uh, this will analyze Japan based on Albert Hirschman's um, exit voice framework. Uh, he is also the author of Bargaining with Japan, What American Pressure Can and Cannot Do. So um, he has a very wide range of interests involved with Japan and economic and political system there. So uh, this is the first time I've been able to entice him to the Woodrow Wilson Center um, since I came here. So we're very happy to have him here. and. Uh, Look forward to his presentation. Thank you. I, I, I did speak um, to, at the Woodrow Wilson Center about 11, 12 years ago, um, right after the electoral reforms were introduced and, and, and uh, talked about the new electoral system and how it was going to empower the prime minister and how it um, might bring about a lot of change in Japanese politics. It's taken, taken about 12 years, but in some ways some of, some of that has, has borne out. Um, I want to um, follow up on IG's talk by looking a little bit more in the forward direction, um, building on his bringing us up, up to the present, and also talk a little bit more about policy, especially economic policy um, implications of the election. Um, the, the word I've, I've, I've uh, emphasized in the title here is trajectory. A lot of people um, looking at the results of the 9-11 election in Japan um, 
have been struck by somehow the Japanese politics being put on a new trajectory um, with Prime Minister Koizumi winning a, a large um, landslide victory. Um, some people um, have interpreted this as meaning that the LDP is back to its old dominance, um, that Koizumi has, has, has locked in the power of the prime ministership in a way that will allow him to exercise bold leadership, and that maybe he's, he's consolidated enough power to really lead boldly in the direction of economic reform. So I want to ask, make all of those into questions, and um, see, see whether um, that really stands up to scrutiny. Of course, we're looking ahead. It's, it's, it's hard to know um, what the ultimate verdict will be, but we'll try to, to see what we can tell um, based on what's happened up to now. Of course, um, looking at this first question, has the LDP returned to its old one-party dominance? It's useful to place the election results in a little bit of a historical context. Um, rather than looking at vote totals, this gives you seat totals for the parties. And you can see the LDP um, uh, in 1990 with a number of 275. That was roughly average of what it had enjoyed since 1955. 1955 to 1990, um, winning a majority at every single election, supplying the prime ministership um, every single time, um, you had the old predominant LDP. And then in the next four elections, starting in 1993, you see that the lower vote totals that, that IG mentioned translated into much lower seat totals. And the LDP was only able to win around 230 or so seats, um, less than a majority. Now this time we have Koizumi's vote total there, or seat total, 296 for the LDP. Um, this, on the one hand, looks like, whoops. On the one hand, looks like um, the LDP has surpassed its old, old total, in old predominance level. Um, indeed it has. 296 out of 480 seats is the largest percentage of seats the LDP has ever won. Um, it, when you add in Comento, which you probably should because they're a coalition partner, um, the ruling coalition just won two-thirds of the seats. So this indeed was a landslide, and um, if this were sustained, um, it would mean the LDP was back as a predominant party. Um, first point to make, though, is that this is just one election. Um, four elections in, the, in which the LDP had these kinds of totals should make us a little skeptical about whether uh, this number is going to hold up um, in, the, in the future. It doesn't take much uh, a reading of the news or a following of the polls to know that this result depended very much on Koizumi's popularity, the popularity of Koizumi, not the popularity of the LDP as a party. So this tells us very little about um, what the LDP is going to do in the future under different leaders. Um, yeah, one, one other point to keep in mind about interpret, um, jumping to conclusions based on landslides is to remember uh, many examples in politics, such as Margaret Thatcher, 1986 in Britain, winning a, a huge landslide for the Tory party, um, and we know that didn't deliver the Tories um, very many years of hegemony. Um, they're a long way from that right now. And of course, Margaret Thatcher benefited from something that Koizumi benefited from as well, and that was the seat bonus that's provided by a single-member district plurality system. Um, in, in, in both the British system and in the single-member district portion of the Japanese system, um, a small boost in vote share, the LDP vote share in single-member districts went from 44 to 48. A small boost in vote share can deliver a disproportionate boost in seat share. So LDP went from 56% of the seats with 44% of the vote to 73% of the seats with 48% of the vote. You know, 48% is a very respectable share, and single member district systems, um, not many parties are able to win uh, 48%. Um, you know, in, in Britain, the, the ruling parties rarely win that kind of total. So this is an impressive vote total, but Koizumi is very much benefiting from the, the, I should mention, the Komeito's support, but also um, from the, the effects of the electoral system, which manufacture this kind of majority. Now look what happened to the Democrats. Their vote share in the SMDs barely changed between these two elections. Mm -hmm. 
um, but their seat, shares, seat share went from 35% to 17%. It looks, if you look at seat numbers, like the DPJ imploded, but really what happened to them is that they lost, um, seat, lost votes in exactly the wrong places. They lost votes in the urban areas that were closely contested, where losing just a few votes shifted the seat from the Democrats to the LDP, and the LDP virtually swept the urban areas, um, taking advantage of this ability of Koizumi to appeal to the independent voters who are concentrated in those urban areas. So this, this too, though, should lead, lead us to, to be cautious before concluding that the LDP has locked in its old predominance, right? These are urban swing voters, independent voters, who temporarily have swung from the Democrats in fairly small numbers, really not very many numbers, um, from the, in the urban areas in, in a little bit larger numbers, swung from the DPJ to the LDP. They could easily swing back at the next election, and you could see a similar swing of seats. I, I expect Japanese politics <coughs> over the next decade to act more like British politics, where single member districts exa exaggerate vote swings. Small vote swings lead to big swings in seats, and almost by mathematical certainty, this is eventually going to deliver the power to somebody other than the LDP. Um, because if the LDP suffers from a, a, a bad vote swing in a lower, in a lower house election year, um, it could easily swing right back to the Democrats if they can stay united. Okay, so let's turn to our second question. Has Koizumi consolidated the power of the prime ministership to the point where he and his successors can offer bold leadership and force members of the party to follow? <laughs> um, and so we have Koizumi uh, glad-handing with um, President Bush and, um, and mimicking in some ways his presidential style of leadership. Um, and he, he's also trying to duplicate President Bush's a dominance of the Republican Party. Um, and he would like to be able to dominate the LDP in the same way that, that President Bush dominates the Republicans or, or um, Tony Blair dominates the um, Labor Party in, in Britain. Um, this is, is very much what I anticipated when I spoke um, at the Woodrow Wilson Center um, earlier. The electoral reform laws of the 1990s and also administrative reform um, in the late 1990s both gave additional powers to the prime minister. Both the administrative reforms gave him more power to initiate legislation um, and the electoral reforms by creating single member districts gave Koizumi the power to do what he did in this election of targeting Kame and the LDP rebels and, and depriving them of a party nomination and appointing his own person. Under the old electoral system with multi-member districts, it was very hard for the LDP leaders to punish their opponents. Their opponents could run anyway. The, 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 the rival faction members could run anyway even if the LDP leader didn't like them and even if they were deprived of a nomination, they could frequently win. Um, but um, Koizumi was able to take that nomination away from people and, and use that to, to dramatic effect in this election. Um, he's been using other powers as well, the ability to dominate the selection of cabinets, to take that power away from faction bosses, to reward people who followed him and to punish those who did not by promoting them or not promoting them to his cabinet. Um, he also used uh, his policy of cutting public works spending to try to deprive his opponents within the party of campaign contributions by reducing the amount of money going to pork barrel politics. Um, so this has been a consistent strategy of his to run against these guys rather than the Democratic Party and, and win the popular support that way. <clears throat> On the other hand, um, Patty's going to talk more about the postal privatization issue, which was the number one issue of this election. Um, but I'm going to give my own brief um, take on it, which is to emphasize that this was an unusual kind of issue, in some ways very fortuitously chosen for Mr. Koizumi to really triangulate his opponents. Um, first, it's, it, he enjoyed high personal popularity, and he could use this issue 
to, to boost his reform credentials. That certainly helped. But it helped, secondly, that this was an issue with great reform symbolism that actually hurt a very small number of voters. Only a few people are, are postal workers or um, postmasters. Um, there were, you know, certainly some voters may have worried that their local post office might close, but this was a not, not a big turnoff um, to large numbers of voters compared to changing the labor market rules to allow um, easier um, firing of workers or um, raising the consumption tax or really tackling the budget deficit, um, all of which would have involved a lot more pain for a lot more voters. This was an issue that was very attractive in that it had great symbolism but only cost a few votes. Um, it was also complicated enough so that Koizumi could compromise without the public realizing it. If you're going to raise the consumption tax, it's really hard to, to pretend uh, when you compromise. It's either going up to 8% or it's not going up to 8%. But postal privatization is one where you could fudge. You can stretch it out to 2017. Um, you can make a last minute change that allows the government to buy back shares in the privatized postal corporation if it's necessary that allows the different parts of the post office to continue working together even after they're supposedly separate. So you can introduce these kinds of fine print that the voters don't notice and still run on the, as the big postal privatization champion and get enough of the LDP to go along with you because you've compromised. Um, finally, that he benefited from the LDP lacking a, a standard bearer that um, was, was attractive. So all, all of that, before you look at these numbers too much, should make us um, um, wonder whether Koizumi can repeat this on many other issues. Um, if he were to decide to stay in power and, and fix the fiscal problem by raising the consumption tax, it's not at all clear that he could use the same strategy to isolate his opponents and kick them out of the party and get them to join him in raising taxes. Um, it's not, that same strategy won't work for every issue. So I'll give you one more on the other hand so that I'm fully covered um, um, and, and, and look at some of these numbers provided by, uh, courtesy of Ethan Shiner. Uh, what Ethan did was divide up the electoral districts in Japan, single member districts, into three groups of 100. The 100 most rural districts, the 100 medium ones, and the 100 most urban districts. Um, you can see this is this is the kind of consistent pattern that bore up again. The LDP does extremely well. The red is the LDP. Um, does extremely well in rural areas. The DPJ does horribly in rural areas. These are consecutive elections? Consecutive elections, the last four elections. Sorry. Okay. Now look at the most urban districts. You have before this pattern in these first three elections, you have the Democrats doing very well in the last three elections in urban areas the LDP doing poorly. But look what Koizumi was able to do. That big influx of urban voters that Aichi mentioned, unaffiliated urban voters, delivered the LDP an additional 40 urban seats. Most of these people depend entirely on Koizumi doing well to, for their political careers. They were only elected because they got in on Koizumi's coattails. And if Koizumi leaves and is replaced by an uh, unattractive, conservative, rural member of the LDP, they're not going to win next time. So there is a real constituency within the LDP now for the re Koizumi reforms to continue, for somebody like Koizumi to take his place. So that's the optimistic spin on how this could really mean a new kind of leadership in Japan. I guess I promised that was the last on the other hand. But there is one more. One more. How many times have I flipped here? Um, but those 40 people that I just mentioned are all first-term members, first-term junior members of the LDP. Um, at, at, as in any political system, they have much less influence than the veterans in the political party, and these are the veterans. Um, and what you'll quickly notice when you think about the veteran LDP members is that they all come from rural areas, Nagasaki, Yamaguchi, uh, Shimane, um, Gunma, even, even uh, Tanigaki who comes from Kyoto comes from the northern part on the Japan seaside. Um, these are, th this is the traditional LDP uh, voting base that is represented by 
most of the people in contention for either becoming the next leader of the party or um, being a powerful influence like Aoki in the selection of the next leader of the party. So will the LDP follow Koizumi if he tries to force the party to approve a 50% reduction in the rice tariff? Um, this could be on the agenda if the D Doha round comes to comes close to a conclusion and they, they decide to wrap things up by liberalizing agricultural trade. Japan may have to dramatically reduce its rice tariff. Um, will Koizumi be able to force the, this LDP to follow him in supporting that? Um, I'm not sure he can pull a post office on this issue. Um, will he be able to do, revisit the highway plan, um, which he, he had taken up earlier, and scale back highway construction um, so that they spend less government money and help um, clean up the fiscal situation? Will he be able to get all these rural people to follow him on that? Can he do the post office on it? I'm, I'm sort of doubtful. So that's my last um, flip and is where I stand today about where Koizumi's ability to, to, to lock in leadership and boldly lead. But as you can tell from this uh, discussion, it's hard to talk about leadership without talking about policy, talking about where you're going to lead. And um, that inevitably brings us to, to policy. I'm sorry that, um, that IG and I have dueling um, two by two tables that put the axes on different directions. <laughs> but we're trying to do something similar. Um, everybody who looks at Japanese politics starts with this national security cleavage. You've got the hawks over here who want to do more in national security, um, larger defense role, and you have the progressives over here, the doves, who want to, um, Japan to do less or no more than it's doing today. Um, and this, this, this is the status quo. But the new cleavage that Japan has been dealing with for the last 15 years or so is the economic cleavage. And I try to group all the different issues that Aiji talked about into this kind of convoy capitalism versus neoliberalism uh, dimension. Convoy capitalism is Japan's version of the welfare state. Instead of having large transfer programs to, to unemployed, Japan has had um, a, a banking system that keeps companies afloat so that they can keep workers employed. They've had huge construction spending so that anybody who's, lay, who's laid off can get a job in construction. And they've had a large a government role in the economy through the postal um, finance system, through public corporations, and through regulations that protect large sections of the economy from competition. So businesses can stay in, in business, jobs, are protected, and that's the Japanese version of the welfare state. And Kame, and uh, and and another um, influential politicians, Koga Makoto, are very much in this camp here of defending convoy capitalism. The LD, this this chart here is from 2002. If any of you came to my talk at the CSIS um, in 2002, I I showed this chart and showed where I I considered the LDP to be at that time. Um, and where Koizumi was, clearly in the more neoliberal direction, favoring disposal of bad loans, fiscal restraint, and privatization. Let's think about how much the system has changed since 2002. The first thing that's changed is the Democrats, uh, because the liberals uh, disbanded and mostly joined the Democrats, we now have the Democrats moving even further in the neoliberal direction, a little bit in the national hawkish direction, uh, Ozawa pulling them over there, um, moving over here. And we have Koizumi pulling the LDP um, in this direction, um, especially with the result of this election, the 40 new urban diet members supporting a more reformist policy. Kame eliminated from the party, so Koga is still there, but um, smaller group of people on this side of the party. My judgment, though, is that the LDP is still barely on the neoliberal side of the status quo. Now that they've privatized the Postal Service, I'm not sure what else they really agree um, needs to be done to move further in this direction. I agree with Aiji that they're basically in the same place, right? Uh, Koizumi and Hatoyama, or we could put uh, Maihara and um, Okada here as well, 
the, the reformists in the LDP and the reformists in the DPJ are roughly in the same position. They want to move policy in this direction. But they're both pulling parties that are, include elements that are back over here. So that's what makes me um, uh, additionally pessimistic about the chance of what exactly this re election represents. It certainly represents the privatization of the postal system, but does it really represent much of an additional movement in this direction? Can, Koizumi can't pull the same tactics that he did before on many additional issues, and the rest of his party is not that eager to follow him further in this direction. So I, I'm um, rel quite tentative in endorsing any of those bold conclusions about the new trajectory of Japanese politics after the 9-11 election. Thank you. Thank you very much. Our next speaker is uh, Patricia McLaughlin, and she's Associate Professor of Asian Studies and Government at the University of Texas at Austin. And over the past uh, year or so, more than a year, she's been um, heavily researching uh, postal system privatization in Japan. And uh, so we're very happy to have her here now that um, the selection has taken place. And uh, she's currently completing a book on that topic which we're all looking forward to. Um, she is also the author of Consumer Politics and Post-Tour Japan, The Institutional Boundaries of Citizen Advocacy. And uh, when she spoke here um, a number of years ago, she talked about consumerism in Japan. So we're very happy to have her back. Thanks very much. Well, thank you very much for having me. It's a pleasure to be back. And actually, I.D. Sun and I were on the same panel the last time we were both here. So mm -hmm. it's very good to be back. Um, I want to look at postal reform and try and make sense of what has happened and where Japan is heading in terms of its postal system and how the postal system, how the postal system is linked uh, to the broader financial and political system. Um, and since it's a rather complicated topic, I thought I would organize my remarks around four sets of questions. The first, hopefully, will give you some background information on the system, and I'll simply ask the question, why has the reform of the postal system, of all things, become so central to contemporary Japanese politics and economics? I'll then ask, why did Koizumi succeed in busting up the postal services and privatizing them? And here I'll focus less on Koizumi's political strategies than on the broader systemic developments which I believe enabled him to achieve his goals. I'll then ask to what extent will the postal system actually change, and here I'll briefly touch on the implications of postal reform for the fiscal investment and loan program, the FILP. And then finally, I'll have a few things to say about what does the story of postal reform tell us about political change more broadly. Much of what I have to say uh, really reinforces what has already been said before, so I'll keep that part brief. Um, so first of all, what's so special about the post office? Why so much attention to postal reform? Well, Koizumi, as we all know, has crusaded on this issue for many years. He actually had this to say about the postal system, quote, Postal savings and postal insurance are like extraterritorial areas in the financial sector. They collect money from the public in more advantageous conditions than the private sector, and the money flows into public corporations and is wasted there. It's not fair, unquote. Now, he made these remarks in 1979, and he has continued to beat that drum ever since, as we all know. Um, and I think what has driven his attention to this one particular issue above all others are four things. First, and perhaps most obviously, is the fact that the state-run postal savings and life insurance systems are, represent enormous amounts of funds. They're not subject to most forms of taxation, and they are guaranteed by the government. As such, they enjoy a huge advantage over the, the private banking system. And Koizumi and others have argued, many economists have argued for good reason, that this is unacceptable at a time when the financial sector and the economy really need a boost. Also troubling to Koizumi has been the way that postal savings deposits and insurance premiums have been invested by the government over the years. And at issue in particular is the Fiscal Investment and Loan Program, the FELP, Japan's system of governmental interference in the financial sector and the economy. In the past, under the FELP, Postal savings deposits in particular were channeled into the Trust Fund Bureau of the Ministry of Finance and then redirected in the form of low interest loans to local governments, targeted industries, 
and increasingly a wide array of special corporations, many of which carried out wasteful government pro public works funds, uh, public works projects rather. Now while the FILP helped fuel post-war economic growth, as early as the 1960s, critics began to question the need for government access to such a massive reservoir of funds and they began calling for wholesale reform of the system. And a particular concern to these critics were the effects of the FILP system, the postal savings system which fed into it, on the private banking system. They were diverting deposits away from the commercial banks and then investing them in other entities of the economy at rates that were more competitive than those of the private banks. For a mature economy, so the argument went, this would need to change. A few years ago, as a result of initiatives taken by Prime Minister Hashimoto, the Trust Fund Bureau was abolished and the postal system was allowed to invest its savings deposits and insurance premiums in the private market. But as, that, as it turns out, more than half of the funds of the savings and insurance systems are being used to purchase special government issued bonds known as FILP bonds. And much of the proceeds from these bonds are then channeled into those notorious special corporations. In other words, not much has changed despite these particular institutional developments. What Koizumi would like to do, although he hasn't really spoken about it in public, perhaps because it's too complicated for um, an election in particular, I, I think he would like to see postal savings and postal insurance programs completely cut off from the FILP in an effort to strangle the FILP because I believe he'd like to see it go away. Third, although Koizumi's been um, not too vocal about this either, he has been very critical of the powerful vested interests that have arisen around the postal services. And I think two clusters of interests warrant special attention in this regard. The first are the roughly 19,000 commissioned postmasters. Uh, these uh, individuals are represented by two occupational organizations, Zentoku, the National Association of Commissioned Postmasters, and Taiju, an intermediary organization linking the LDP to the postal system that consists of retired postmasters and the families of active postmasters. Since active postmasters as civil servants are forbidden by law to take part in uh, electoral campaigns and other political activities, Taiju more or less does the dirty work for them. The organization helps boost memberships of individual politician koankai, it recruits LDP party members, and all Taiju members are also party members of the LDP. Uh, Taiju mobilizes voters behind conservative politicians at elect election time, et cetera, et cetera. Together, Zentoku and Taiju are second only to Nokyo, the Agricultural Association, as a political support base for the LDP. At the peak of their power toward the late 70s and early 1980s, these organizations were capable of mobilizing approximately one million votes behind the LDP in upper house elections. So when Koizumi talks about reform with no sacred cows, you can be sure that Taiju and Zentoku um, are very much in his mind. The second special interest that has been a problem, particularly economically for Japan, has been the so-called Yusei Family Jigyo, or Kigyo, um, the postal family firms. These are the countless small and medium-sized firms that supply the postal systems, system with employee uniforms, mail sorting equipment, bicycles and motorcycles, fuel, ATM machines, building materials, it goes on and on, and they also help maintain and service all of the above. Many of these firms are directly linked to special corporations that help carry out postal services, and all of these entities are, the, are major destinations for amakudari bureaucrats based in the Ministry of Internal Affairs and Communications. It used to be known as the Ministry of Post and Telecommunications. Well, as you might expect, postal family firms monopolize their particular corners of the economy, and they are awarded contracts via fixed bidding procedures that are often far above market cost. They are, in short, highly inefficient, albeit poorly understood, mini sector of the Japanese economy. Now, Koizumi feels that with privatization, these political and economic vested interests connected to the postal system, political, bureaucratic, and economic, will gradually disappear, thereby enhancing financial and economic efficiency in Japan while removing another set of barriers to future reform. Now finally, without overestimating this, I think it's important to note 
But one other factor in Koizumi's crusade against the postal services has been a deeply personal one. Koizumi has been burned since early on in his career by the political machine created by Ta Tanaka Kakue and his followers. It was Tanaka who first mobilized the postmasters behind the LDP in the 1950s when Tanaka enjoyed a brief stint as Minister of Post and Telecommunications. And his followers long colonized the old Ministry of Post and Telecommunications and affiliated special corporations and, co and private firms. It was Tanaka's machine that marginalized Koizumi and other uh, proponents of market-oriented reform during the 1980s and beyond. By tearing down the uh, Japan's postal edifice, Koizumi hopes to destroy <coughs> Tanaka's political legacy once and for all. My second question, given the power of the vested interests within the postal system, how on earth did Koizumi manage to bust the system up? The simple answer, of course, is that Koizumi, as has been mentioned today already, uh, appealed directly to the public for support and sidelined his political opponents in the LDP who had prevented the passage of the six postal privatization bi bi uh, bills. The results of this gamble, as we all know, were astonishing. His party has won the highest percentage of seats ever in the September 11th election. And then he went on to uh, achieve an easy legislative victory as his bills sailed through both houses of the Diet just one month later. Now, while Koizumi deserves great credit for this success, I think that credit must also be given to a number of political developments that predate his prime ministership. And the most important, as has already been illustrated, I think are the 1994 electoral reforms, which ironically Koizumi opposed when they were passed. The winner-take-all system created by the new single-member districts enabled Koizumi to cast the election in simple policy terms. You're either for postal reform or you're against it. And this would not have been possible under the old electoral system in which LDP candidates had to suppress policy debate as they ran against each other in multi-member districts. Since the LDP could only field one candidate in each single member district, the system also enabled Koizumi to weaken his opponents by refusing them the party's official endorsement. Second, I think we need to pay attention to the gradual weakening of Tanaka's grip from the grave over the party. Uh, the last of his followers, including Nonaka Hiromu, a formidable opponent of postal reform, have largely disappeared from the scene. Now, the legacy of his actual political machine has not completely disappeared, but the characters who have run that machine uh, more or less have. And that has uh, paved the way for Koizumi um, to trumpet his, his postal cause. My third point is that related to both electoral reform and the decline of machine politics has been the steady weakening over the factions over the past decade, and particularly since 2001 when Koizumi came to power. The Hashimoto faction, the Tanaka's faction, uh, Tanaka faction's direct descendant and the locus of the party's strongest opposition to postal reform is leaderless and in disarray. And other factions, meanwhile, appear quite fluid and many of their leaders are publicly downplaying the importance of these positions. And this has facilitated Koizumi's efforts to build an intra-party coalition behind his objectives and to appeal directly to public opinion for support. And finally, excuse me, the, I think we need to look at the decline of the organized vote, which again has already been touched on. Even before 2001, the electoral power of the postmasters has been declining along with that of construction, agriculture, and other groups that have formed the mainstays of the LDP's Jiban. And filling that vacuum are the floating voters, those urban-based, educated voters who are much less susceptible to the persuasive powers of local opinion leaders like the postmasters and who are far more amenable to Koizumi's vision of reform than earlier generations of voters. Exit polls conducted on the day of the election indicate that in some urban and suburban districts, LDP Kome candidates captured as much as 70% of the floating vote and as has been noted, this is really a significant change. So to sum up so far, I, my main point here is that Koizumi's strategies to win the election and to pass those postal privatization bills were less a reflection of his personal political talents than a product of broader political change. Had he tried to accomplish the same electoral goals 10 years ago, had postal reform been his issue, and he, well, he had been, if he had been prime minister 10 years ago, I think he would have failed abysmally. 
Now, third question, and on to the future. To what extent will the postal system actually change? And the answer is a mixed bag. Some things, I think, will change significantly. Others won't. And for some dimensions of the postal system, there's a big question mark in front of us. But at the most fundamental level, the structure of the postal system will change quite dramatically. As you know, starting in October 2007, the postal services will be broken up into four private entities, savings, insurance, mail, and over-the-counter services. Overseeing those companies will be a government-affiliated holding company, which will gradually shed its shares by 2017. And we're on that in a minute. Now, Koizumi likes to think that this is the biggest thing to happen to Japan since the Meiji Restoration. Uh, for reasons I'll discuss later, I think this is a bit of an overstatement, but he is right probably to say that it's one of the biggest um, financial changes in Japan to occur in the post-war era. For ordinary citizens, the local post office will begin to look quite different. As purveyors of privatized mail, savings, and insurance services, the post office will offer more services and will be free to dive into various retail services as well, including travel agency services. Eventually, some may grow to resemble convenience stores with postal counters, much like the sub-post offices found in British neighborhoods. What won't change all that much, I don't think, is the presence of the postmasters, particularly in the um, rural areas. The privatization legislation in includes stipulations calling for the preservation of universal mail service and the network of nearly 25,000 post offices around Japan. And of particular importance are the tiny post offices, the commission post offices in small rural areas that lack commercial banks, credit unions, or credit associations, and private insurance companies. To maintain this network, a large government fund will be established to help small post offices remain solvent in the context of either declining populations or competition from private firms. And that fund will be worth upwards of 2 trillion yen, so that's a significant amount of money to keep them afloat. This provision is of great social significance that should not be underestimated in small rural communities where postmasters perform informal welfare services, particularly for the elderly. And one of the descriptions of that fund is that it will help the postmasters continue to perform those social welfare functions in smaller communities. At the same time, however, the provision means that the postmasters will not disappear anytime soon. Although there will no longer be civil servants, civil servants and may have to submit to more competitive hiring procedures, they're unlikely to lose their jobs as a result of economic competition in any great number. The steady weakening of the postmasters as a vote-gathering machine notwithstanding, this could allow the postmasters to preserve at least some semblance of political influence in the future, at least in rural areas where they have been most influential. But if the LDP continues to develop as an urban-based party, as it seems poised to do, this shouldn't be much of a political problem. A more troubling feature of the old postal system that may survive the privatization process is governmental involvement in postal services. Koizumi had originally hoped to completely sever the government's ties to the postal system by 2017. But as a concession to his opponents, the bills were amended last summer and they were unchanged when they were resubmitted in October to allow the government to buy back some of those shares in the holding company after that particular date. This could result in some problems in the future, one of which is the continuing use of postal savings and insurance funds to finance government projects. And this brings me to the big question of the ongoing post office saga and how will the postal reform affect the fiscal investment and loan program? What, in other words, will be the relationship between postal savings and insurance on the one hand and, on the other hand, those FILP entities? Now, there's a strong possibility that this relationship will be maintained at least over the short term. The privatization uh, bills that were just passed did not address this relationship, how postal savings funds are, and insurance funds are going to be used, in particular, by government entities. Apparently, the issue will be worked out over the coming months as uh, committees are put in place uh, within the government to hammer out the details of financial reform. As we speak, moreover, Koizumi is driving up plans to privatize eight governmental financial institutions, including the Japan uh, Bank for International Cooperation, uh, the Development Bank of Japan, and six others mostly connected to ministries. 
These are some of the largest recipients of postal funds in the, in the past, and they're the entities that have channeled funds to small and medium enterprises, public corporations at the local level, ODA projects, Okinawan development, and so on and so forth. Now, those who are in, uh, in favor of radical reform argue that these entities must be reformed if private financial institutions are to operate on a truly level playing field, particularly in the arena of financing for small and medium enterprises. So Koizumi now has his eyes on these financial um, entities, which I think is probably the next step in dismantling the FILP. Unfortunately for Koizumi, however, he has less than one year to tackle these big institutions, which en enjoy considerable support, um, including among those um, uh, individuals that showed up on, on Len's screen at the end. The finance minister is against the privatization of the Japan De uh, Bank for International Corporation. The uh, agricultural ministry against, uh, minister against the um, privatization of the entity connected to his ministry, and it goes on so on and so forth down the line. So there's a lot of resistance to this particular stage of reform, even amongst uh, Koizumi's staunchest uh, supporters within the LDP. Finally, another question mark surrounds the future of the postal family firms. Will the injection of the profit motive into the three main postal services result in competitive bidding processes and the subsequent demise of this incestuous network of firms? Or will the cozy relationships survive these reforms? Uh, again, since this issue has not been a target of legislation, much depends on how the details of privatization will be hammered out over the next few months. Finally, what will all these changes uh, do in terms of creating a level playing field for the commercial banking system? Well, if we listen to the commercial banks, they're not going to do much at all, and they have a lot of reasons um, to support this argument. The new Post Savings Bank, for example, will begin as a nationwide entity and it will dwarf, as such, the regional and city banks. In fact, its assets will be greater than those of Mitsubishi UFJ Financial Group, which was recently formed, and the Postal Insurance Corporation will be two times larger in terms of assets than Nippon Seimei, Japan's largest commercial insurance provider. If fairness is the name of the privatization games, then these entities should probably be broken up into regional entities in much the same way that NTT was broken up into regional, into regional and functional uh, corporations. It's possible that this will occur, barring unforeseen um, opposition. The committees in charge of hammering up the details of postal reform have a mandate to consider the breakup of the postal banks into regional entities. Whether this occurs or not, time will only tell. The private sector is also complaining about the fact that since its creation in 2003, Japan Post has been developing new products and services that will probably give the postal savings an edge over the banks after 2007. And the most recent innovation that occurred just over the last couple of weeks has been the introduction of investment trusts, Japan's term for mutual funds, which are not backed by government guarantees and in, per uh, in fact their first day on the market, um, the performance was quite good. So it looks like here is another area of intense competition uh, in which the postal uh, savings bank may have an edge, at least initially, over the private banks. Mail service sector is also moving quickly to create new services and organization, or corporations <coughs> like Yamato and other parcel delivery corporations are complaining about that. So to sum up, well, Koizumi's postal privatization package constitutes a big financial reform, but not a revolution. I think in order for privatization to truly have a reverberating effect throughout the financial system, Koizumi has to proceed very quickly in uh, attacking, ref radically reforming other institutions of the FILP, starting with those governmental uh, financial institutions. And finally, I'll only say a few things about this. Um, I want to ask a, or talk a little bit about what postal reform tells us about Japanese politics more, ge uh, more generally. And I'll focus on two points. And both Len and Aiji san really, uh, I think, illustrated the importance and the denouement of the development of a floating vote. And I want to look at the other side a little bit and see what the, the uh, changes among Zentoku and the Taiju, the two postmaster, uh, organizations tell us about the decline of the organized vote. Now, we knew that those, those organizations were beginning to decline before the election, and their activities during the election indicate that that decline has simply accelerated. 
in the uh, weeks leading up to the 9-11 election, in prefe uh, prefecture after prefecture, Taiju pr chapters refused to throw their weight behind the LDP, choosing instead to support the uh, Kokumin Shinto or the Nihon Shinto candidates or dependents who had voted against postal privatization. In some instances, Taiju chapters gave their members the freedom to vote their consciences, which is a first in their history, and they've been around for almost 50 years. Across, across the country, moreover, Zentoku and Cha Taiju severed their relations with their so-called komong, or consultants. These were LDP politicians and friends of the postal system who attend postmasters' events quite regularly and represent them in the LDP and the bureaucracy. Similar trends seem to be affecting other interest groups. Nokia was hesitant to back LDP candidates in many prefectures, fearing that once postal, pro postal privatization is launched, the government will then set its sights on agricultural policy. And since Koizumi is also planning to attack the medical system, the medical association behaved in much of the same fashion. So Koizumi's electoral strategies have clearly accelerated a trend toward the decline of the organized vote, but whether that trend continues depends heavily on Koizumi's actions over the next year and on who succeeds him as LDP president and prime minister. Meanwhile, the postmasters and other interests, no doubt, are doing everything they can to ensure that someone more sympathetic to their interests exceeds Koizumi. In fact, many of them were heard to say uh, at the local level that this is just a temporary blip on the landscape. We'll be back. So um, we'll see. Finally, and I'd just like to spark a little, um, the, I think this fits into some of the economic uh, comments made by particularly Len, and uh, maybe this will spark some conversation later on. But I'd just like to comment that I think Koizumi's success in postal reform, and that's a, a success with some caveats, represents a partial victory by globalization and market forces over Japan's more traditional capitalist methods. Postal privatization was, in effect, a battle between two visions of the political economy with Koizumi and uh, companies singing the virtues of market principles and his opponents, lo largely rural-based, uh, struggling to pre preserve the remnants of a political economic system that prized state leadership, financial so so uh, socialism, and informal welfare functions. I would think that Ka Koizumi's landslide win on September 11th and the subsequent passage of those reform bills one month later represents the growing supremacy of market forces over developmental capitalism. And I think the symbolic of this importance of this um, is particularly significant. But that victory, again, could be short-lived if the Koizumi government fails to keep interest groups at bay or alienates the private sector by bungling the postal privatization process or the introduction of additional reforms. And I think I'll leave it at that. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Well, we've had uh, much food for thought uh, put onto the table. I'd like to open it up um, to your questions. Um, yes, Arthur? Yeah, I, as an economist, I'm going to be asking a particularly political question that you haven't addressed. Uh, what, what I've heard described uh, by all of you is that, is that Koizumi's political strategy was seems to be conceived of as the anti-Tanaka. Uh, without from what you said or what I've seen, much of a uh, strategic view of his own. And what we, I, I believe we have not seen is a new Tanaka, or a new Tanaka kind of um, uh, strategy that brings together new interest groups, uh, new clientels, urban-based, uh, uh, away from the dying areas of the countryside and the uh, small businesses and small shops. Uh, which leaves either the, uh, the Democratic Party or the LDP open to those kinds of pol politicians of the Tanaka Roosevelt type who know how to, who can see the, that coalition out there who can put it together and who are not in the, uh, you know, in the group of dinosaurs that you picture. Uh, just as Koizumi was kind of an unpredictable uh, sprout, a mushroom who, who arose uh, in the middle of the night, um, could we be seeing, if there is such a person, this kind of brilliant politician with the view towards uh, where, where, the, uh, where the strength lies in a new, co a new coalition of clientele? Uh, that's my question. It's a kind of a very political question and not economic at all. Thank you. 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 Thank you
Well, it's maybe I'll for you yeah, all. I'll take a first crack at it. Um, one one thing that makes it difficult to do what you're suggesting is that these coalitions traditionally have been built among organized groups, and what Koizumi and the reform agenda is about is disempowering the organized groups and empowering the average taxpayer, consumer, um, voter. And so it's not surprising that Koizumi hasn't built a new organized coalition to support this agenda. Um, he very much depends on continuing to be able to mobilize this unorganized group by giving, serving the, the public interest, if you will, having good economic results, um, avoiding uh, keeping, getting the budget in, in better shape, and these kinds of things will be re rewarded if he can do that by continued, continued support. But I, I don't, you know, you're, you're right that somebody else could, could come and try to do the same thing and say that's going to be my strategy too. I'm going to cater to the, these same unorganized voters. Um, I, none of the people that I pushed, showed in the, right. in none the picture is, um, has demonstrated much skill at, at doing that. And Koizumi is, even though you say he's a mushroom that sprouted in the, in the night, um, was that your metaphor? Yeah, yes. um, was, was, you know, he had contested previous LDP presidential elections. He was part of the YKK group that for many years was everybody's alternative to the Tanaka dominance. Um, and so I think the people that I showed are, are, the, are the potential mushrooms. <laughs> there may be somebody I'm missing. And so, I mean, Yoshi, I, 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 I left out one person from the LDP who didn't fit my generalization about being rural, and that was a Yosano Kaoru, mm. uh, because he represents downtown Tokyo. Um, <laughs> but he, he doesn't have a very organized base. He's the current leader of the Policy Affairs Research Council, uh, very close to Koizumi, a very much um, representative of the urban taxpayer consumer group. But he lost an election not too long ago um, because he has no organized base. And I'm not sure he, maybe he's a mushroom? I don't know. Whoa. Anybody? <laughs> Opinion? Uh, I have probably pretty much similar reaction to Len. Um, but uh, okay, many people think that Koizumi, you know, uh, realigned that the, the, uh, transformed the LDP into a new party. And he himself believes it, I guess. But uh, I don't think Koizumi has organized anything. You know, uh, just he said, just like Len said, uh, Koizumi just mobilized unorganized voters who are very, you know, temperamental. <laughs> they might go out to vote. Sometimes they don't want to go vote, go out to vote. And he just tried to utilize those things. And uh, that was simply because uh, like just uh, opposite tactics to depending on the, heavily depending on the organized voters. So, and uh, growing up in Koi, um, Koizumi, growing up in Yokosuka, and you know, Kanaga Prefecture, which is right next to Tokyo, and very urban area, and actually suburban area. And many of the residents around Koizumi are commuting to Tokyo, and they don't spend their lives in, in that area. They spend their Sunday and Saturday there, and they, go to, they, they spend their lives in Tokyo and so forth. So all those urban you know, employees of big corporations uh, do not have any agent which who represent their own interest, and someone wants to, you know, someone needs to represent their interest. That would be like Yosano or Koizumi, who would be working for the unorganized voters and independent voters, highly educated, working for the big corporations. And if the Japan's economy goes well and their lives are okay, but for other people, like uh, those people who are supporting for Kamei or uh, or uh, Aoki of Shimane or uh, Takeshita. And uh, typically, like uh, Tanaka factions, the big leaders, have strong organization, organizer supporters. And those, pe <coughs> those voters who support those politicians have the clear agent, like uh, Takeshita or uh, Kakue Tanaka or uh, you know, Aoki. Those are strong agents. And Obuchi, Obuchi too. And uh, as far as uh, LDP provides special benefit, like subsidies, to Shimane 
or a special favor for construction uh, industry, or a special favor for agricultural cooperatives, and so forth, they can survive. No matter how bad Japan's governmental deficit is, no matter how stagnant the Japan's economy is, how small the Japan's economy is, market is shrinking, how, you know, how bad the market is shrinking, as far as they get money from the government, they can live, live well. Therefore, they keep supporting those organizations. Kamei is saying that we can borrow, you know, we can issue the bond, and we can lend the money and borrow the money for 100 years. And our ancestors, you know, young, you know, younger generation, you know, and grandsons and granddaughters, and they will pay back, and, but we will just borrow the money. And, but most urban residents of J Japan do not believe that kind of story. I mean, Japan will go bankrupt pretty soon, and we have to you know, shift it. And then Koizumi is saying that. So Koizumi is I mean, you know, appealing to those unorganized uh, urban, urban voters pretty well. But I don't think he has uh, you know, any organization. He has not organized them. Uh, so I don't think it, any, anyone will. Mm -hmm. So from here on, the Japan, will, Japan, the ruling party of Japan will be depending on the performance of the government. An incumbent party does a poor job, then alternation power will take place. Because more voters in urban areas will turn, go out to vote. They, now they know that they can make a change. And uh, Koizumi made a big change, just appealing to unorganized voters. And uh, from 1993 to year 2003, those voters were so much frustrated they don't go out to vote. Because two parties, I mean, DPJ and LDP, neither one is uh, you know, representing their, their interests. I think. Therefore, the voting turnout rate went down. And then organized voters kept winning. Um, I second pretty much everything that's been said here. I think they hit every nail on the head. Uh, but that is a very interesting question, what's going to happen next in terms of leadership and who will take over um, from Koizumi. Um, my, I'm cautiously optimistic, I, but I think the LDP is very much in flux. It's a fluid situation. The old rules of the game are suspended. Um, we're not sure what the new ones are, and the results of this one election haven't been institutionalized. As Lynn uh, suggested, it's going to take several electoral cycles before we see if there's really a new kind of LDP and a new political system along a Westminster style. Uh, but I really think the future is Koizumi's to lose right now if he can maintain the momentum. Uh, and successfully carry out more reform, picking, um, uh, uh, continuing the momentum of postal privatization, then there's a good chance that this will continue. But I'm cautious here because what remains to be done, uh, starting with what he's now looking at uh, with the government financial institutions, he's going to see a lot of resistance from members of his inner circle. And that could um, uh, be an incentive for new kinds of factions to arise, some kind of groupism within the LDP could arise out of this if the opposition proves to be strong enough. But I, I, I do think things have sufficiently changed that the future looks um, pretty good. Uh, um, but if Koizumi does mess up over the next year, um, I think there, we do have to keep in mind the possibility that the LDP could revert a little bit back into the past of its association with interest groups. Thank you. Yes. Thank you. Uh, this was a very domestically focused lecture about a very domestically focused election. Also, could you please identify yourself? Oh, Robin White from the Japan America Student Conference. Uh, and yet there are a lot of issues like the SDF in Iraq and Yasukuni Shrine and the U.S.-Japan security relationship in North Korea that never seem to come up at all. So the question is how did Koizumi get away with focusing things so much just on one issue, and is this an anomaly? Are foreign policy issues likely to come back much more in future elections? I don't think they've ever been part of elections. <laughs> <laughs> well, well not, not the security yeah. debate was big for years. Yeah, um, yeah, yeah. No, no, go ahead. No, and I wanted to let somebody else go first. <laughs> go ahead. Oh. <laughs> That's a tough question. Um, I think, 
the fo uh, first of all, policy has already always been underestimated and de-emphasized in elections. And what's significant is that one policy finally dominated an election. An election, and, and Japanese elections have been so organized in the past around personal ties and flows of pork barrel money and so on um, that what has happened is extremely significant. Um, and there is a simple reason why postal reform dominated this to the detriment of other issues that may even be more important, uh, and that is that the election was called after the dissolution of the Diet after the failure of these bills, so it was a good excuse for Koizumi to cast the election in black and white terms. Uh, but that's a very good question, and, and I'm, uh, I'm very curious to see if the, old, the new electoral system plus Koizumi's initiative and perhaps those of other leaders will result in more policy discussion in the future during elections. Um, but I think that's a common argument and a common complaint that these important issues of Iraq and so on didn't enter into the election. Voters complained about it, too. Mm -hmm. uh, um, can you, oh, go ahead. Um, actually, traditionally, like, uh, foreign policy have not be played a big role in Japanese elections, I think. And uh, um, I mean, because Japan has not uh, faced any wars, you know, I mean, impossible period. And uh, so Japan's, Japan's voters' uh, biggest concern is pretty much economy. And so international, if uh, international economy is a big issue, it might have been affected. But, uh, um, but in last one decade or so, you know, since 19, early 1990s, Japanese are concerned with its economy f such for a long time. Mm -hmm. And uh, therefore, Foreign policy becomes a kind of secondary issue, I think. And, and also, Koizumi deliberately tried to conceal it, I think. And I, and I think that's for sure. I, I heard that Koizumi said at one point when asked about a foreign policy issue that the postal savings was going to make Japan stronger. <laughs> His post postal savings reform would make Japan stronger. So that he could bring, he managed to bring everything back sure. to that issue and shift things away from what he was worried would be a vote losers. That's been done here once <laughs> Thank you. Yes, here. Uh, the studies, US political studies have shown that. Uh, uh, could you please identify yourself? Culture. Thank you. Uh, Glenn Meyer with uh, uh, WITA. Um, studies in the US have shown that uh, in US politics, image is more important than issues. Have studies in Japan shown that image is more important than issues in Japanese politics also? We know hair is very important in Japan. Is <laughs> <laughs> image more important than mm -hmm. issues? Oh, well, I'll give it. Hmm. Seems to be, um, I don't know, good question. We have to answer. <laughs> <laughs> Actually, I don't, I don't want to admit that you know, image is more important. Like, uh, many Japanese political commentators say that was the Koizumi theater and the Koizumi effect. He showed up on TV so well, and he is so persuasive on TV. He knows how to manipulate TVs and so forth. But I don't buy that argument um, because, I mean, then, then policy is important? Maybe not. But not, uh, um, okay, uh, what I have been studying is the uh, voting behavior and people's attitude, what kind of co cognitive ability each individual voter, average voter has. And according to our study, you know, average Americans, average Japanese do not manipulate so much political information. We don't understand the difference between Koizumi's reform plan of pension, and then Okada's in DPJ <coughs> pension plan reform. We don't see the difference so much. And average voter cannot differentiate so well. And uh, so are the American voters. And then what makes a difference is not just, Im and then people tend to think the image makes a difference. But we, we think, well, I think at least, um, if the candidate bring, you know, come across with a clearer message of the bigger vision, like, uh, you know, what kind of country the Japan is going to be. And, uh, for example, the Breer, uh, Breer did very well. You know, he said, you know, uh, laissez-faire, you know, small government policy of the such uh, went too far. And, uh, however, the old Labour Party's social welfare economy didn't work very well. So he's a third party. So we are going to bring new things to Great Britain. And uh, Breer had clear vision where the United Kingdom is going to. And then he had a pretty clear, you know, message, short, clear messages. And so did the, um, Ronald Reagan in 1980s. Reagan said, you know, um, United States is 
good country. We are strong. We should get our confidence back. And, he, and then he said, I don't think the Americans are living too rich, but the American government is living too rich. So cut the, cut the budget and then reduce the tax and so forth. Now, on the other hand, uh, President Carter in 1980s, you know, he gets like a three billion, three trillion, <laughs> twenty billion, and so forth. He gets very precise, you know, budget plan and how he can bring the economy back and so forth. But Carter's message was too complicated, too long, and for the average voters, it was too much. And average voters, I don't, I'm not saying that the average voter is dumb. But they are, they are very clever. However, average voter are so busy, you know, processing the uh, political information. I mean, they are busy with their own business. Like, uh, they are worrying about dealing, or they are worrying about market economy, they are you know, worrying about the market share of the, each product, or you know, uh, you know, exchange rate and so forth. They are worrying about their own business, and they don't worry about what politicians say. They don't spend two hours reading the Reagan's you know, platform and the Carter's platform, then, which could appear easier. And then Reagan's uh, message was shorter and, you know, easier to follow. And then Koizumi's message may not be precise, but that's easier to understand. And Okada's message was longer, could be precise, but it's hard to follow. So actually, Okada was not wrong, just this is something. Someone who says clearly what he's doing, and someone who doesn't come across at all. Someone says something, but we don't understand what he said. And then someone, at least we can understand this guy. And that this guy was Koizumi this time. So it is not uh, just image competition between images, but I think competition between information processing. How, how we can make a shortcut of information cost? And then Koizumi provided a shortcut more easily to the voters, I think. If I could just comment on that. Um, I, I agree, except when I think about what happened in the election with postal reform. Um, voters complained a lot that they didn't understand what the issue was all about. How is it going to affect me? And what does it all mean and who cares? But Koizumi seemed to put it in such stark terms, you're either for reform in our future or you're not. And then the, and then the Democrats came up with no positive message of their own. They just seemed to be counteracting to, to Koizumi. To me, to a significant degree, for the average voter, it came down to Koizumi seems to have a more positive image. Let's go with him, even though uh, post we're not sure what postal reform is all about. Mm -hmm. Now, that's not based on any statistics that I've seen or anything. It's just by reading the newspapers and <coughs> hearing interviews on television with, with ordinary voters. But I think image did come into it a lot. Um, the debate on postal reform was surprisingly thin uh, this last election. Yes, here in the middle. Uh, my name is uh, Yukio Kashi. I'm a Japanese newspaper, Sankei. I'm afraid my question might uh, distract you know, from today's topics, <laughs> but then, uh, my friend, uh, uh, Mrs. White, then asked a question regarding with the Yasukuni Shrine. Uh, my question is uh, uh, regarding with that again. Um, we know uh, the reason why the uh, Chinese people and the Korean people are angry or against with uh, Koizumi's uh, paying visit to Yashikuni Shrine. Uh, because uh, uh, some meaning they are afraid of uh, right, the revival of Japanese militarism. Oh, I, I really want to know the real mind of the, the, the United States, and not the Tatemai. <laughs> uh, I asked I li my question to uh, Professor McLaughlin or uh, Professor uh, Scopper. Um, I asked uh, my friend, an uh, uh, American friend, oh, do you support the uh, uh, Japanese uh, uh, Prime Minister's decision to pay visit and ask him Everybody said, oh, no, no, it's a uh, uh, Japanese internal matter, up to them. But then uh, I really want to know the you are real mind. The other day, mm -hmm. I asked uh, the question in a daily press briefing with the State Department. But the State Department, the chief spokesman, avoided to answer to, to, to my question. <laughs> I didn't want to know that uh, American people are uh, real mind about this issue. Are you concerned about the <laughs> Japanese <laughs> and the <laughs> <laughs> um, Well, I, I, fortunately, as a 
as someone who doesn't work for the United States government, I'm freer to speak than, than the people you've probably been speaking with who are very constrained by the fact that they're representing the U.S. government. Um, I'm just one citizen, um, so I can't speak for the American people at all. But um, in, in, in my opinion, I think Koizumi has been doing a terrible disservice <coughs> to Japanese diplomacy by insisting on repeatedly visiting Yasukuni Shrine. Uh, regardless of whether you think that there's a, um, um, a moral religious purpose for visiting the shrine, it's quite clear, I think, on objective grounds that he is hurting Japan's national interest by doing this. Um, he's isolating the country um, in the region um, unnecessarily. He's um, at a time when, when the, the region is very much in flux when wh which direction Korea goes um, in, in the kind of post North Korea um, world is, is, is in flux. He's um, increasing the likelihood that South Korea will tilt towards China. Um, he's isolating, he's, I, even though your American informants aren't, aren't telling you this, I think that the United States too is becoming worried that um, this could aggravate American relations with China if, if President Bush goes over and um, shakes hand with Mr. Koizumi after he's just back from Yasukuni, um, it's not going to improve America's image in Korea or China. And if the future post-Koizumi leader insists on, on continuing to do this, I think maybe one, the American government is not being too outspoken about this because they hope that the future next leader after Koizumi will have more common sense and um, will not um, continue this tradition. I agree. Um, uh, I think there are two sets of considerations for Koizumi when he visits the shrine, one domestic and one international. Uh, and he's emphasized the domestic. He's speaking to a growing constituency um, that is nationalistic, not necessarily in a bad way. Uh, and he's also speaking to the war bereaved families who are quite powerful apparently even today. What I don't know is to what extent is Koizumi um, uh, influenced by that particular organization. There's another gr uh, group that's been very powerful in politics. And, um, not many people seem to understand them. But I think, uh, I think the advantages that he gains on the domestic front are undermined uh, by the drawbacks on the international front um, for the reasons that he, that Lynn has highlighted. Uh, I think it causes far more damage, therefore, than good uh, for Japanese diplomacy. You, 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 the reason why you said that it is because then, uh, Japan might be isolated or, or uh, it hurts the relationship between Japan and then, uh, China or South Korea. Does the United States and uh, you know, I just said that uh, herself on uh, hate and uh, poison and visit to, to Yasukuni Shrine. Okay. <laughs> Absent that, I suppose that wasn't the issue. Oh, if the foreign so if, 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 the, if, if, if South Korea and I, I think it's fair to say that if, the, if South Korea and China were not upset with Japan over the Yasukuni Shrine visits, most Americans would not care much at all. Um, you know, the, the Americans are much quicker to forget history and, um, and let bygones be bygones, and certainly the U.S. and Japan have, a, have many years of, of productively working together that are as important to most Americans as, as what happened 60 years ago. So you're, you're right, Americans probably care much less about visiting to Yasukuni, except that we see the damage that it's doing to uh, Japan's relations in the region. Okay, uh, yes, over here. Uh, my name is Chris Hill. I'm here at the Wilson Center. I'm also at George Mason University. And I, and I have a, a very quick comment and then a question. And my comment is, speaking as only one other American observer, uh, I've come to the judgment that the visit to the Yasukuni Shrine, which I've done on a couple of occasions, is, <laughs> is actually a healthy thing for particularly for the U.S.-Japan relationship and ultimately for Japan's own image of itself in the world. And it's part of the overcoming of the last remnants 
of the dependency relationship with us and therefore a very healthy the thing which I applaud, recognizing that it's causing other people a lot of heartburn. Um, but my question goes back to the, the focus of the discussion today. I've observed um, in other domains the so-called privatization, this English word that gets used to describe institutional reform of the universities, of the, the government laboratory system, uh, and so on in Japan. And I'm wondering whether that series of um, cosmetic reforms that lead to the creation of new quasi-governmental institutions like the Agency for International uh, for Industrial Science and Technology, the AIST, which used to be government labs and is now supposed to be private except the office is still in the Medi headquarters and so on. Uh, <laughs> isn't this creating a, a terrific problem of accountability and governance in the Japanese governmental system which over the long haul is going to be more problematic than if these organizations were in fact in the government and you could at least keep an eye on what what they were about and how they were functioning. So that talking about creating a huge new quasi-private bank with all sorts of privileges and competing with real private banks. Um, is this in fact a positive reform or in fact is it moving in a bad direction for the country? Well, um, the way you asked the question highlights that there are pros and cons of, uh, with what has just happened in postal reform at least. Um, I just recently read that the new postal organizations, uh, companies, one for each service, are a special kind of uh, juridical organization known as a tokubetsu or tokute tokubetsu gyosei hojin, a special administrative organ mm -hmm. that's supposed to be private, which to me seems like a contradiction in terms. Why not just call it an enterprise <laughs> if it's going to be truly private? And the fact that the government is going to buy back some of its shares after 2017, after going through the motions of dumping them on the market, um, suggests to me that, as you have indicated, that the line between public and private is going to be very, um, private and governmental, rather, is going to be very, very uh, porous. Um, just how porous it will be remains to be seen. So yes, it is an issue of accountability, and I think it's, there's a lot of precedent for this. This has happened a lot in the Japanese economy with privatization and reform of different um, enterprises. Uh, it seems to be, to use a phrase that's used quite often, the Japanese way of doing things. Um, it's not complete market reform, uh, and, and I recognize that 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 could lead to some troubles in terms of accountability. So yes, I agree with you. Do you want else like to comment on that one? Um, no, not on that one. <laughs> okay, thank you. Uh, yes, so I think we have time for one more question. Or, uh, we'll have two more questions. Yeichi Koyang, retired SEC incumbent. I uh, was wondering about this privatization and also this split up of the postal system, which had a privileged position in, in Japan, and which brought forth a great deal of, uh, of development in Japan in, in a socialized sense, in, uh, in uh, make, remaking Japan from the very beginning. But now we put it in a privatization basis, and we face the problem of uh, globalization, in which many foreign banks may wish to take over Japanese financial institutions and the success of the takeover of the long-term credit bank in the in Japan which is a, a very successful venture by uh, foreign bankers in, in, in Japan and foreign bankers may have a very greater competitive advantage in their philosophy of doing business which is the pursuit of, of money and um, uh, it may not be to the advantage of Japan in its growth, are you uh, is does the Japanese factor into that consideration that the that there is a great and large capital market system outside of Japan, which are going to come in to privatize and uh, merge with other Japanese institutions such as Nikko Securities, was taken over by uh, foreign bankers as well, and the. Uh, and that is, is a probably a, a, a tendency to do that. 
And of, of course, in Europe, a great many interchange of banks have taken place among many European banks, including a new, new venture here by Santander in the uh, Chicago banking system, which is a Spanish bank in uh, Chicago. And that made the internationalization of that whole thing. And the foreign and the Japanese people must realize that a great many of their financial institutions may be taken over by foreign bankers. Thank you. Um, Ashley, that was a huge consideration. Not huge, it was a significant consideration in postal reform. Uh, there's a politician in Japan, used to be a member of the LDP until he was ousted just last week by Mr. Koizumi, named Arai Hiroyuki. And he's known as Mr. Post Office because of his opposition to reform. And he said that anyone who does not believe in the postal system cannot be a true Japanese. And to privatize the postal system means to open the system to foreign domination. And this resonates quite strongly, particularly in the countryside, um, because there is a sort of sometimes, I think, simplistic equation of, of foreign ownership with simply the profit motive, motive with no attention to the public interest. So there is great fear about this very thing happening, and it is possible that there will be some foreign capital coming into the Japanese postal system um, uh, now that privatization is going to occur. So yes, it is an issue, at least in, in privatization. Um, my personal view is that I, I think it can be a little overstated. Uh, I don't think it is that serious a threat to the social fabric of Japan. <laughs> Okay, uh, let's have one more question. Uh, my name is uh, uh, Takuya Higuchi uh, with Juju Press, Japan's news agency. I have one simple question. From your point of view, who is the best politician for the post Koizumi or uh, successor of <coughs> Mr. Prime Minister? <laughs> <coughs> <coughs> Uh, you're going to go, yeah. <laughs> go ahead. I, I take fast. Right? <laughs> he gets the vote. You know, other two people can follow up. Uh, yeah, it's hard to say, but uh, I don't know which is the best for the world peace or which best for the Japan or <laughs> best for the United States. The answer may be different. However, um, what Koizumi could do and what Koizumi has not been able to do, you know, when we think about those, like uh, Koizumi, I mean, as a uh, man said, uh, because we disservice the foreign, you know, foreign diplomacy or foreign relationship with other nations, especially neighboring nations. And uh, um, he considers that from the election campaign issue. However, Koizumi has not been, I don't think he will be able to, within a year, he will be restore the good diplomatic relationship with China or South Korea. And so if Koizumi wants to leave his name in, his, in the history, uh, then he can appoint someone who can do two things. Keep the continue. I mean, continue to reform the Japan's economic system and the political system, and uh, you know, escaping reforming from the clientelism to the more modern, more you know, co open, competitive political system, and also uh, economic system as well. Like, not depending on the clientelism, but for the more free competition. That's what we wanted to do with Takenaka Heizo's help. So probably he will choose someone who can continue that kind of re economic political reform. But on, on the other hand, what he could not do, or he ha has not been able to, or he cannot do in a, in a year, is restore the good diplomatic relationship with neighboring nations. And uh, who can do that? Uh, Kato Koichi could be, but he's out of power now. <laughs> and then probably, I don't, I don't think I'm, you know, I'm endorsing or anything, just but realistically, Aso is pretty hawkish. I don't think he can, because he's going to Yasukuni too. <laughs> and uh, other people, and Abe Shinzo, he would love to go to Yasukuni as well. <laughs> <laughs> and then who can do that? Tanigaki was, would be the only the one possibility left. Tanigaki can be the, uh, the Minister of Foreign and Finance, and uh, he can do the ki same kind of uh, economic reform. And, but he has been uh, Miyazawa's, you know, fa or ex Miyazawa's faction, no, no, no longer, however. And, uh, but uh, those are like the uh, same group as Kato Koichi, a pretty pacifist. You're, hope in you're ignoring Davish. the other part, Maihara? <laughs> Maihara? Maihara is very close to Koizumi. I mean, uh, not, not uh, psychologically, right. but positioning-wise. And according to my analysis of the content analysis of the statement, Maihara in diplomacy 
It's pretty close to Koizumi, except he doesn't want to go to Yasukuni. So Maihara could be a good option too. Maihara or Tanigaki could be a good option. And, but I, I don't think it's, you know, it is only for the sake of the restoring the diplomatic relationship. I'm not, and the, for the purpose of the, you know, di different purpose, different person could be the best for each one of you. <laughs> so, so I can't say who is the best, but, but if Koizumi, you know, uh, sucks, try to you know, pass his throne onto someone who can, who can do what he could not do, <laughs> then Koizumi would be a successful prime minister. But if, if he can you know, just to want, wishes his successor to keep the same tradition of going to Yasukuni, he will, not, he will destroy the Japan's <laughs> diplomacy for the future. <laughs> <laughs> of, the, of the different people that he didn't mention, uh, the one that um, I think has some potential is Fukuda Yasuo, um, who is close enough to Koizumi in his years as um, cabinet secretary to have been very involved in the diplomacy, good re um, would, would certainly work on good U.S.-Japan relations, um, but probably is, is, a, is common sense enough that he would, he would um, avoid going to Yasukuni um, and therefore might improve relations with the neighbors. I, I don't know as much about his views on economic issues, but he seems less, less wedded to special interest groups than some of the other people. So he might also promote some, some of that. Um, in terms of who might be next, it seems that the public is who, most supportive who would prefer of. To be next? Who would I prefer? Well, That's first I'll tell you, you what, I think the public do. wants Mr. Abe, no, which no, is very no. interesting. Um, and, and I have to say, I, I don't want to skirt this issue, but um, I know some of these politicians better than others, at least I know of them. Um, but I have a favorable image of Taninaki. And I agree with your assessment on the foreign policy front. I think he'd be, he'd be fine there. Uh, I don't think he's as much as a nationalist as uh, Koizumi is. But economically and domestically, he's very smart, uh, very good at finance, um, and apparently has an excellent reputation as finance minister. And he's also had his fingers in many other economic financial pies. Uh, the problem, I think, for his political future, if he's hoping for a bid to be prime minister, is that he doesn't have the base within the LDP, and he's a relative unknown amongst the public. This isn't someone, this isn't a Koizumi figure who, who relishes the attention of the public. So while he's certainly qualified for it, I think politically he has some weaknesses. But he'd be my vote, I think. <laughs> if you push me to the... <laughs> Well, thank you very much, uh, um, everyone, for coming out here. And I think the weather has improved somewhat, so hopefully the traffic won't be as bad as this morning. But um, I appreciate your coming, and uh, and the Asia program hopes to see you back here soon. Thank you. Uh, Amy, may I have a last word? Um, as most of you heard, uh, this is Amy's last program with us. Um, she's been a key member of the Asia program staff now for five and a half years. We have benefited immensely from her presence here. Um, I've learned a lot from her, not simply on Japan, about Japan, but other parts of Asia as well. Um, I don't think she mentioned it, but outside is a copy of the most recent publication which she has produced, which in fact only came back from the printers yesterday. Um, if you look at it closely, uh, not only will you see that she's very sneakily put her own picture on the front. She claims it's not her picture, but I believe it is. Um, but beyond that, it's just another splendid example of why we value her here uh, and why we will miss her. Um, Amy, we will miss you. Uh, we thank you for all the wonderful work we, you have done. Uh, we're flattered that you and Sam have decided to name your child Woodrow Wilson. <laughs> Does Sam know that, by the way? Uh, not yet, no. Uh, uh, and we certainly wish you Godspeed, and we certainly want to see you back here on a regular basis. Um, I wish everybody here would join me in a round of applause for Amy. Thank you. We now are adjourned. <laughs> Actually, I'm now organizing programs. <laughs>